In this episode, I speak to Brent Earlywine about lessons from the dojo floor. We explore the leadership lessons that can be learned from practicing martial arts, emphasising the importance of being fully present in the moment and developing awareness of others. Brent shares how martial arts helped him cultivate skills such as predicting outcomes, continuous improvement, focus and long-term goal setting. In this conversation, we discuss how martial arts impacts on leadership and vice versa. We explore the concept of achieving a Zen state of mind, highlighting the benefits of calmness and rationality in handling conflicts. We also look at the finesse required in martial arts and how it parallels with mastering a professional skill set. I create clear thinking and decisive leaders who can amplify their influence. Contact me to find out how I can help you or your organisation. And today our guest is Brent Earlywine. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. You're welcome, Brent. Do you have a favorite book? Um, I have several favorite books. I'm a little bit of a, um, I'm not sure what the term is, bibliophile, or, you know, I'm a huge, voracious uh, reader. I probably go through 50 or 60 books a year, every year. Um, and I'm not a Kindle guy, so I like the physical book. So uh, I have an entire <laughs> wall in my my living room downstairs that's floor to uh, ceiling bookshelves, and it's, it's overflowing. Um, I probably end up with a couple of favorite books per year, um, usually leaning towards because I've been in martial arts uh, for such a long time. There's several. Uh, there's a book called Left of Bang that I really, really like. Uh, there's one by Gavin De Becker called The Gift of Fear. Um, and I have one uh, called uh, Righteous Mind. Not I, I have one, but one that I've read called Righteous Minds that uh, is also kind of on my required reading list for some of my students. So um, we can talk about books all day if you wanted to, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you might have to come back and do that because okay. my dream is to have a library in the house and I've there just go. been yeah. lost in there would be really cool so tell me a bit more about you because you talked about your students sure um probably a couple of things so you know I've been in martial arts now this is year number 36 and counting um so you know that's that's part of my identity it's not being a hobby a really really long time ago um I actually own and run a full-time school or a dojo here in uh, Pittsburgh Pennsylvania in the states uh and I'm celebrating year number 25 for having the school wow. Um, and I don't teach kids. I only teach adults. So that's a, uh, an important distinction to make. Right. So this has always been kind of on the side. It's not my career. I don't do it to try to make money. So it's more of a, you know, passion project, passion for myself um, in my own personal development, as well as passion for trying to help other people uh, be better versions of themselves. And we can have a discussion about that. That's a pretty deep concept. Uh, so martial arts has been, you know, a pretty consistent uh, theme and dynamic in my life now for three and a half decades and counting. And then along the way, you know, from a professional perspective, um, I am in high technology sales, but I'm focused in a really particular type of high technology sales. So uh, most software, most high technology solutions go through a channel or a partner of some kind. So I focus on what's known as channel sales. So I'm supporting partner relationships, distributor relationships. Uh, so really those indirect routes to market. So it's a specialized kind of corner of the sales world. Um, so that's been, uh, again, almost the exact same time frame. My, uh, you know, thir 35 years plus and counting been focused really on that piece of uh, selling in the high technology software, software as a service kind of space. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So You're tell welcome. me, which, which art, uh, martial art are you training? Yeah, so I've um, for the last 25 years, um, I've been in uh, traditional Japanese uh, style of art. So uh, um, actually Koru uh, lineage. Koru just means kind of, you know, ancient traditional right versus a sport version that you might mm -hmm. see. So traditional uh, jujitsu. I also study and teach a, a traditional uh, Japanese swordsmanship uh, school. Um, over the years, I've done other things. Um, I have one of my first black belts was in a, a Korean style. That was um, a long, long time ago. I'm starting to show my age with the gray hair on my face. Um, and then I also um, I also study and teach actually an Irish stick fighting uh, system that uh, I launched back in uh, 2019. But my core piece is really the the Japanese arts and the Japanese swordsmanship. Mm, interesting. So the thing about jujitsu, as you said, it's not it's not a do, it's not a sports. But it's kind Correct. of it kind of what holds together all the other arts that's underneath it. 
It, it does, that's a good observation, actually. Um, and I, I draw a really bright distinction. So most people hear the term jujitsu today and they think of Brazilian jujitsu or mm -hmm. martial arts. Um, and that's really a more, quote unquote, modern day kind of interpretation. Um, mm -hmm. And, that's, you know, it's it's a great style. It's a great system. Um, you know, here from the Gracie systems. That's not what I study. That's not what I teach. Uh, that's really a little more sport. And my definition of sport is when there's tournaments that are uh, defined by rules and referees versus koru, which is, you know, traditionally and historically battlefield arts. So Japanese yeah. traditional jujitsu is very different than Brazilian jujitsu to kind of shorten it. Yeah, I, to I totally understand that. It's um, And I think, and now we're going to talk about how how martial arts impacts on leadership and the other way around but i sure. think what's interesting about jiu-jitsu is that because it contains all the other arts it's something that takes a long time to master because you're actually you know it's not like with karate where it's punching kicks and that's it you know you're looking at pressure points you're looking at throws and kicks and and all yeah. sorts of bits and pieces so it's so it takes maybe it takes a different type of discipline because if you're doing a, a, a doe art, which is a sports art, generally speaking, the people aren't really going to get hurt. Whereas if you're doing, you know, uh, a jiu-jitsu, you're more likely to get hurt if you're not careful. Yeah, I mean, I could tease out probably four or five really good salient points in that, uh, Jude. I mean, the, the first one is, you know, traditional historical jujitsu is, you know, it's a zero sum game. That's how it's designed, right? So it's joint locks, joint breaks, uh, throws, takedowns. And then there's um, in the, the, the Japanese systems, there's a heavy overlay of incorporating uh, traditional battlefield weapons at the same time. So from a depth of material, it does take a really long time to uh, to master it because there's so much there. There's so many dynamics and aspects to uh, to understand and while when it's empty hand, but especially when you start adding all these different weapons, short weapons, long weapons, bladed weapons, staff weapons, uh, sword, you name it. There's an awful lot there. It's a very uh, uh, robust and rounded uh, type of systems. Um, and that was part of what attracted to me, uh, attractive to me originally was I was interested in some of the the weapon stuff as a younger man, right? So um, it, it vastly and quickly turned into something else for me versus my original intent. But uh, there's such a depth there, even at 35 years and counting, I still tell, you know, myself and my students, I still feel like a white belt. There's still so much I don't understand yet that I've got mm. to refine and keep training and even stuff that I thought I mastered, I go back and peel it back apart and go, oh, you know, I missed something there. There's another <laughs> air yeah. to it. I didn't see. <laughs> That makes sense. So tell me then, um, what are the kind of leadership lessons that can be picked up from being in the dojo? Yeah, um, I mean, there's a there's a pretty long list um, and I have that um, some of it outlined in my book and there's probably enough material to do a second or a third one to be quite uh, frank about it. Um, I, I tease out a couple of them, uh, June, and we can, you know, kind of flow through some of these. Um, uh, first one that I'd start with is you have to be 100% in the moment um, in something that's important. And what I mean by that is on the dojo floor, there's nowhere to hide, right? So you either understand the material and can basically show it, replicate it, apply it, or you don't. Uh, so you're training and you're learning, but you know, you're know you effectively um, on your own. You either have that skill or you don't. So you have to be completely 100% in the moment during the moment to make sure that you could deliver against that for lack of a better phrase. And that has shown up over and over again in my professional career. When you have an important conversation or you're in a boardroom or you're in a conference room or you're negotiating a significant deal, you have to be completely focused um, or something can skitter sideways on you very quickly. It's easy to uh, you know, lose the thread in the moment. Um, and I've always said when you're having a, a critical conversation in a, a professional or a business environment, um, it can all come down to just one set of a few seconds in that conversation that will determine whether it goes one way or another way. So you have to be 100% in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And that comes from focus to you can spend time doing meditation to just, you know, length of time of studying to, you know, personal drive and motivation that you really want something. There's a lot behind that, but uh, that would be probably the first one I'd tease out for you. 
Brilliant. Thank you. How does the awareness that you pick up on in the dojo, i.e., you know, you need to be super aware of what's going on in front and behind and sideways. Yeah. How does that awareness flow into how you lead? Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, there's um, in the art that I study and I teach, um, when you get to uh, fifth degree black belt, the fifth degree black belt test is what's known as the Saki test, S-A-K-K-I. Um, and essentially, it's the ability to sense a killing intent um, mm-hmm. from behind, from the uh, the soke or the grandmaster of the art, um, essentially is cutting down towards the back of your head while you're kneeling on the floor. Uh, today, you know, it's done with a, a wooden boken, uh, so people are relatively safe, but you have to sense that kind of intent and then get out of the way. You either get smacked and you fail the test or you roll out of the way, not not get hit, and then you pass the test. So that's also an example of 100% being in the moment. You can't be uh, distracted. Um, but over the years, um, you get an opportunity to really kind of read people. Um, uh, individuals and human beings communicate all the time. If you're paying attention to it, they're telling you all kinds of stuff, um, even non-verbally. So things like body language to positioning to tonality to pacing to rhythm in their uh, their speech patterns to you know uh, proximity, close, far away. Um, angling, right, face to face, off to one side, from behind. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have ill intent, but uh, people will essentially uh, not be able to not communicate is how I would say it. Uh, so that ability to read people and read intentions um, almost starts to become second nature. We all kind of do it anyways, but to be aware of it and then to cultivate that skill and then to apply the skill comes with time, effort and focus. And that has shown up in the career and professional development all the time as well, where you can really get kind of a second sense on, you know, where somebody coming from, are they really interested? Are they not interested? Are they upset um, and they don't want to tell you or, you know, whatever the case may be, but uh, you start to really become a um, uh, a student of human nature and human uh, body language and human communication um, at a person to person level. And it fosters that development in the dojo, but it certainly have uh, have seen it uh, applied in the career on a daily basis. OK, thank you for that. Would you say then that as a martial artist that you are on amber light most of the time so you're not stopped so you so you're always in an aware not maybe not a high alert state but you are uh, aware all the time you never get to the point where you're just not aware you know so you so you've got that kind of i'm idling you know i've I've got a car it's not stopped it's idling and 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 if you as a martial artist you have that awareness how does that translate into the workplace yeah another uh, fantastic question i actually don't have that in my book but um we do teach it uh, there's if you do any research on the um uh, do a quick google search on uh, jeff cooper's color codes um essentially it's a, um, a framework to understand levels of awareness and paying attention so um think of you know it's really only four colors uh white orange red and then black um And the white is completely unaware. Um, And I do this a lot in my self-defense classes, but white is, you know, the typical, you know, somebody's walking down the street, their nose is in their phone, they're completely unaware of their surroundings, they're not paying attention, they're completely distracted. Uh, That's that's the lowest level of awareness because you're not paying attention. Uh, Yellow becomes the, you know, something's triggered one of your senses, right? So something's going on. I don't know what it is yet, but something's made me, you know, pause, look up, uh, cock an ear, You know, something's going on. I I need to figure it out. So I got to pay attention in the moment. Um, Orange is you've noticed something very specific that you are paying attention to, and then you've got to decide what you're going to do about it. Um, And usually the example I use for the uh, the white to yellow into orange is, you know, we've all had experiences where we've, you know, gotten in the car and driven home um, out of sheer habit on, you know, the roads and driving the car. But we haven't really been consciously been paying attention because we do it all the time. Um, but if suddenly, suddenly, suddenly somebody in front of you, you know, spikes the brakes and you see the red lights. Now you come into an awareness, you come into that moment and you're now paying attention. You got something you got to deal with. Uh, red becomes, you've got to actively engage with something in the martial arts. Somebody's maybe trying to cause you harm in, in some way, shape or form, and you've got to respond and react. Um, 
black is the opposite of no attention that can be almost where your senses are completely overwhelmed um and your senses get flooded and you can get to a point of you know panic uh where people will say that you know they don't even remember what took place that's kind of the awareness level at an extreme and then to answer your question um, it's exhausting to uh, try to have a high level of awareness all the time. As human beings, it takes too much brain power and energy and focus to do an orange level of awareness. So we have a tendency to bounce between that kind of no awareness to yellow, maybe a little orange back down to white. So that's how we live our days. Um, and then the second answer to the other question is the awareness levels. Um, you can kind of stay sort of aware all the time. Um, and it, it, it gets you in front of when things are going to go sideways, um, and sideways doesn't have to be, have to be a physical, you know, something going wrong, but in the business world, it kind of puts you ahead of the timeline and ahead of the curve that you're paying attention. You see stuff kind of coming down and you can prepare for it or mitigate your risks. Uh, so there's an awareness level from a professional perspective that I think is a, a very clear analog to uh, what we talk about on the physical realm. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I think um, so. You, I, I I forget now what it's called, um, the Japanese term for it. But that, uh, but it, it's a sense of what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, and that works, as you said. That still plays out in the workplace, doesn't it? That you know, someone's about to say something, and you're aware that that's what's that's going to happen, and you know, you start to prepare your next step. Yeah, it's um. I wouldn't say it's a, a sixth sense. I'd say it's a natural human talent, but you have to cultivate it and pay attention to it. Um, but it almost gives you the ability to kind of predict what's going to happen next um, in some way, shape or form. So, again, there's a lot of communication that takes place between humans and individuals, uh, whether it's in a, a professional context or a physical, you know, inside the dojo context. But you can get to the point where you're no longer reacting or you're being proactive and you can say, all right, I, I, I pretty much can predict exactly what's going to happen next. And therefore, I can either respond to it ahead of time or head it off at the pass or, you know, steer it a different direction or, you know, understand maybe that the objection is coming down the road if you're in sales and prepare on what my uh, response to the objection is going to be. Uh, so uh, there's a there's definitely a talent and a skill that can be cultivated and applied. Thank you. What do you think, what has been a martial artist brought to you in your working life that you think yeah. is definitely roots back to the, your practice of martial arts? Yeah, I'd give you probably two really big answers. Um, the first one, um, and I don't I don't study um, uh, Shinto religion would be the uh, the kind of core or main religion in Japan. Uh, it's an amalgamation of kind of Buddhism and uh, their kind of historical uh, religions. And they just kind of mishmashed it together is kind of the short way to describe it. But there's a concept inside of it that I do very much believe in, which is the idea of um, you're always trying to um, make yourself a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday. Uh, you're never perfect. Um, even if you've made a lot of progress um, in the Shinto religion, they'll have a mirror that's inside of uh, the little Kamidana, which is uh, kind of like a mini temple you put up on a shelf in your house or in the dojo. And that mirror, the idea is you're always polishing the mirror. It's a reflection of you. You're looking at yourself. Uh, that's one of the ways I, or reasons I say there's nowhere to hide inside the dojo. And even if I was a decent version of myself yesterday, I can always find a way to be a better version of myself today. And that process never stops. So every single day I'm trying to take some positive step. I'm trying to be a better version of myself. And that better version could be you know, a better physical version, a better version as a husband, as a father, as a friend, a better version of myself in the community, a better version of myself as a leader in business, a better version of myself as an employee or a salesperson or whatever my, you know, um, uh, vocation might be. Uh, so there's always ways to be a better version um, or the attempts to be a better version of yourself. Uh, because again, that process never really stops. Um, so to me, that's been a, a huge component um, in my professional career to uh, always uh, look for new ways to, you know, learn new skills, try new things, uh, expand my horizons um, and whatever I'm tasked with inside of, uh, you know, the corporation that I work for, or my roles and responsibilities to try to be better at it today than I was yesterday. And then the other thing that's attached to that uh, pretty significantly is the idea of, um, it's a term we say in the dojo, gambate, uh, which just means keep going. 
you know, maybe I didn't have a good day, right? Maybe I, I learned a lesson the hard way or, you know, something failed or didn't work out. Um, and having that positive attitude of, I'm just going to keep going, right? Um, keep chugging along, keep going, keep working, keep heading towards that long-term goal. Um, uh, don't give up, um, even in spite of uh, setbacks or something negative that might show up in your life. So you're in Gumbate, keep going. I like that. It's that continuous improvement that, you know, what does what does lead as well, um, you know, to, to focus on. Let's listen to a quick advert. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer and the leading authority on Maverick leadership. She is the founder of The Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press. Welcome back to the Maverick Paradox. This is the podcast for the pathologically curious. What do you think um, your martial art martial arts practice has brought you? Um, well, let me go back just one second. So, um, in the uh, the corporate world in Japan, there's a concept that um, fairly well known now in the Western world. Probably showed up in the the 70s for the United States, for example. Uh, but kaizen, it's the same thing where it's uh, constant incremental improvement, right? So it's a similar uh, idea, or almost the same idea. Um, what the study of martial arts has brought me is, you know, a, a myriad of of benefits. So there's benefits from a just pure physical health level. Uh, a little bit older now, so I'm 55, going on 56. Uh, so, um, you know, I certainly wouldn't be anywhere near the kind of shape I'm in now if I wasn't, you know, training and practicing and having physical activity, literally uh, multiple days a week, multiple hours per day, um, over three and a half decades and counting. I, I just can't imagine not doing it. Um, it's also kept me sane, right? So there's a mental aspect to it, too. Um, in terms of having something to focus on, always something interesting to learn, something uh, new to try, uh, new applications, new levels of understanding. So uh, it's fascinating uh, to me um, what's inside of here. And the deeper I get and the longer I've been in it, the more I find it's almost like new doors keep opening that I didn't even know existed. So there's a mental fascination. And then we talked about a couple of things, but, you know, the ability to focus, the ability to be in the moment, uh, the idea and process of trying to be a better version of myself. Um, and that's everywhere in my life, not just in the dojo, right? I'm always trying to be uh, better for my kids, better for my wife, better for my community, um, you know, and I'm trying to do my best. And what I find is people that are struggling in their life uh, end up being attracted to, to that kind of energy. And one of the best things that I've enjoyed is where I can help other people, you know, help them get a better handle on what's going on or give them some perspective or try to instill some tools that uh, they can go through a similar process. I'm a firm believer that martial arts is one of the few places that you can really craft a better version of yourself over long term. And then probably the last thing I'd say there, and again, we could talk about this for hours, um, but um, uh, long-term uh, goal setting and a results-oriented mindset. Um, so when I say long-term, I'm not talking three months, six months, a year. I'm talking from white belt to first degree black belt is usually about a three-year journey, maybe three and a half. Uh, so that's fairly long-term. To get to fifth degree, uh, you're probably talking about 15 years. Um, and to get to where I'm at, um, you're talking three decades plus. Uh, so these are really, really long timelines and to stay focused and engaged and motivated over that length of time is um, is one very different and I'd say probably pretty extraordinary. Cool. Yeah, and it's interesting because different martial arts have different time periods, don't they, as they well do. to grade. I'm always suspicious of those that, you know, get you to black belt with a ridiculously short period <laughs> of time. Um, yeah, look, I mean, there's... Uh, uh, the, uh, Two answers to that, too. You know, we always say that uh, you have three ranks. You have the uh, the rank that your teacher gives you. You have the rank that you believe yourself is. And then you have the uh, the rank that your peers uh, think you are based on your skills. So uh, regardless of how fast somebody might want to, you know, give you a certificate or tie a belt around your waist, uh, there is a uh, certain amount of time. Human beings, you just you need a certain amount of time to absorb skills and uh, master the skills and be able to uh, show and display and apply those skills. There's no shortcut there. 
No, that's true. Right. So you've got a book out. Um, yeah. And tell us what the, the title of the book is. Uh, it's called Executive Edge, the Martial Arts Blueprint for Executives. Um, and then, you know, kind of a sub tab line that I've used is, you know, lessons learned from the dojo floor. But um, it's been uh, a little bit of a passion project for me. I actually was down the road to put this together almost a decade ago and got about, I don't know, maybe halfway through it, two thirds of the way through it. And uh, this year um, I decided that, you know, it was it was time to stop talking about it and half doing it. And it was time to to get it done. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, though, in your book, you talk about the four Zen states of the mind. Can you yep. tell us what that means? Um, it, so at a, at a high level, um, it's really a way to carry yourself. Um, one of the things you'll hear me say if you spend time with me in the dojo is you can almost get to a point in kind of walking meditation. Uh, people think that you know, a Zen state of mind, which is, you know, kind of a, a foo-foo way to say, you know, um, state of zero, I'm centered, somebody's not going to knock me off my, you know, uh, my game or however you want to describe it. But uh, there's a way to cultivate um, that I'm focused and p things aren't going to distract me, right? So uh, that can be in the physical realm, that can be in the professional realm. Um, if you think through, you know, tough conversations or some sort of inherent human conflict, um, it's really easy to let emotions get the best of you. So the Zen states of mind are um, ways to describe being that centered kind of uh, presence, if you will. Um, and then there's there's I'll always say there's a lot of ways to get to the same place. So, you know, the meditation is a tactic. Um, so you can meditate to cultivate and foster you know a zen state of mind um, but you don't necessarily have to do meditation to get to the same place meditation is a really good tactic and a really good set of tools and there's lots of you know different types of medication meditation uh breathing exercises uh lots of ways to calm yourself back down if you start to get upset um so there's um there's a pretty deep discussion there on kind of tactics and strategies on how to get to the zen state of mind um, but you find if you if you do something over a long period of time and you start to master it, that becomes easier. Um, and I see that in the professional career, if you're doing the same type of job or skill delivery, um, uh, that, you know, they, they almost end up in a Zen state of mind through repetitiveness and practice and mastery of those skills. Um, and from the outside world, you can see that. Uh, so you see somebody that is really, really good at what they do. Uh, you can see they're, you know, in sports, they'll use a term like they're in the zone, right? So it's the same kind of uh, idea with different words, uh, but somebody spending that time and effort to really master something and be in that, um, you know, state of zero, be in the zone, be very focused and not really uh, being able to be knocked off their perch or being distracted or uh, getting upset. Um, and I think it's something that we all should um, really strive for uh, because it's much better to have kind of a calm, cool, collected discussion, even if it's a, a significant subject matter. Um, conflict goes sideways when everybody gets upset and, um, you know, they aren't having a good conversation. We can still disagree, um, but um, if you're not able to do that in a rational fashion, you probably need to back up, take a couple of deep yeah. breaths, you know, come back to it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for that. Do you think um, martial arts teach you to be gentle? Um. Yes and no. Um, I will tell you that I don't think you can be a truly peaceful individual unless you understand what violence actually looks like. Um, so I will trust somebody that has studied and uh, seen real violence and chooses peace every day over anybody else because they're making a conscious effort to uh, be a better version of themselves and making a conscious decision that you know violence is not an answer. And what I find that over time is somebody the longer they've studied martial arts or longer they've studied you know the applications of violence so let's be clear that's what martial arts is designed to be uh, the more likely they are to not use it uh, because they understand the ramifications they understand what it can actually do to themselves and somebody else uh, therefore they choose that last uh, they would much rather 
have a conversation, mitigate a risk, head it off before it ever gets to the hands-on stage. Um, and it just becomes very, very distasteful to go, you know, I don't really want to do that. Um, we don't need to have that level of, of conflict. Uh, let's find other answers to whatever is going on between you and me and somebody else if we're having some sort of conflict. Uh, so uh, it's almost inversely proportional to the length of time you study, the uh, the more likely you are to not use it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And as you go up the grade, the technique you have becomes more nuanced and you learn to be lighter in your application of the technique rather you, than using your strength because you're using techniques. So the white belt that's figured out how to, I don't know, block a punch and, and react would yeah. be all about strength. And the black yeah, belt it's, would be it, about the lightest touch to, to block and the light because it because it's the technique, not the power. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd use different words to say the same thing. Uh, subtle and conscious decision on what to do and what to apply. I would say some of the most dangerous people in the uh, the dojo are typically the uh, the brand new beginners um, because either they don't know uh, what they don't know or they don't know how to control or safely apply something they just learned. Um, and, you know, they can move in unpredictable ways. So that's an easy way for somebody to get hurt. Um, but, yeah, there is a subtlety to it when you have a depth of understanding or a finesse maybe is another way to say it. Um, and that's mm -hmm. another parallel I see in the uh, professional career uh, when somebody has really kind of mastered their skill set and their vocation is the uh, they're able to finesse what they do. And it can be very subtle movements, but very powerful movements um, and get to, you know, the outcomes that they're after and they don't have to do it in some sort of, you know, gross bludgeon kind of way because mm -hmm. they they know better, right? So it, it's not the bull in the china shop anymore. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. Brent, it's been really great having you on the show. Uh, thank you very much. This has been uh, fantastic. You've been asking some, uh, some really, really good questions, Jude. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'd like you to come back, actually, into the new year and we maybe take a couple of chapters from your book and go into them a bit more deeper. How do you feel about that? I would love to do that. That would be fantastic. Excellent. Thank you out there for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I am Judith Germain, and I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation. The Maverick Paradox magazine. The Maverick Paradox magazine is for the pathologically curious. Written by a swagger of socialized mavericks who are divergent thinkers, the magazine tackles the biggest issues affecting maverick leaders today. You might be a business owner or a leader within an organization who wants to have your thinking challenged, to be exposed to a diversity of thought, or to learn from diverse experts in their fields. If so, the Maverick Paradox magazine is for you. Join the swagger at themaverickparadox.com and engage in the conversation.